Seven months have passed since COVID-19 wreaked havoc throughout the world. But the coronavirus cases continue to soar globally. More than 14 million people have been infected and some 500,000 people dead. When all containment efforts seem to fail, vaccines appear to be the last hope against the rapid onslaught of the disease and bring an end to the worst and unprecedented health crisis of the century. Too many people are now infected with uh, SARS coronavirus 2 that it won't disappear. And developing a vaccine and successfully releasing it is the most useful way forward in control of this infection. The bad news is that COVID-19 looks like it's here to stay. But the good news is there are almost 200 vaccine experiments in progress and some 15 are already in human trials. I think the US and China are running neck and neck in the development of a uh, vaccine for COVID-19. Let's not kid ourselves, there is a political dimension to it. But how long will it take before the first vaccine becomes available to the public? How safe and effective will it be against the coronavirus? Hong Kong, with a population of 7.5 million people on 1,000 square kilometers, it is one of the most densely populated cities in the world and a perfect hotbed for rapacious spread of the COVID-19 virus. After enjoying a phenomenal success in bringing the outbreak under control, there are ample signs to indicate that the disease is now spreading out of control. Just recently, the city recorded a daily high of 100 confirmed cases, sparking fears that the next wave of infections is coming to the financial hub, and it could be worse than the first one. If you're blindsided by a weak link, and in their sense, it seemed to be coming from their border controls, the border controls have to be absolutely tight. You cannot allow it to be porous. So the moment you have some weak link, so in their case, maybe the air crew, sea crew, I think especially the sea, the fact that the community at large started to stand down. So you have these measures where people have, but they are taking things easy because they think they're already in the clear, which is a human sort of behavior. That has caused Jacqueline Lowe, a mother of two, to be paranoid about what will happen next. Of late, she has become more health conscious. Mundane activities that used to be taken for granted have now become part of her daily routine, such as remembering not to wear dirty shoes into the house, disinfecting coats and jackets. Jacqueline is a registered nurse who works in a private hospital in Hong Kong. The start of her career coincided with the outbreak of an earlier deadly coronavirus known as SARS in 2003. Back then, Hong Kong was the epicenter of the SARS outbreak. But Jacqueline's fear of SARS is nothing compared to her worry about the new coronavirus, COVID-19. Even as they recover, they can have a lot of other complications, including the problems with clots and strokes and heart attacks and so many other things which are multi-systemic. But the fact that the multi-systemic involvement is much more pronounced with COVID. 
And that particular multisystemic inflammation, depending on where, has a longer tail because we didn't actually see that so much with SARS. The global infection and death toll from COVID-19 certainly confirms Jacqueline's fears. The number of global infections have hit some 16.5 million. More than 650,000 people have died in rising. The US has been the hardest hit, accounting for more than 4 million infections and some 150,000 deaths. Countries have resorted to lockdowns of their own cities. They have also imposed quarantines and other social distancing measures to stem the spread of the virus. But the number of infections keeps rising every day in some countries. We've never seen it before, and so there is no existing immunity in the population. That means that in theory, almost everybody can eventually become infected. The only way that you can control it is to try to physically stop people who are infected coming into contact with people who are not infected. And so you have all the measures that we have in place, the social distancing, the hand washing, the wearing masks, everything to try to reduce the chance of the virus crossing from an infected person to a non-infected person. But beyond that, there is simply nothing that can be done. Governments around the world have been treading gingerly on reopening economies after months of devastating job losses. Early successes in containment have proven fragile. Authorities have since reverted to lockdowns once again, following waves of new infections. It's tough to uh, uh, control a disease through, through uh, just social distancing and, and mask wearing and all that. that that's not how we humans have, have uh, evolved. We, have not, we are social creatures. Our, our livelihood and all that depends a lot on social interactions. We come to work, we, we deal with people all the time. Businesses grow because of you know, meetings, because handshakes, because of trust. A lot of these things cannot be built over the internet. So I don't think that people intentionally go out to break a law. I think it's just psychologically, emotionally, sometimes it is difficult to keep this up. At the peak of the infection in February, more than half of the Chinese population was living under some form of travel restrictions. That's almost 800 million people. By May, Chinese cities began to gradually lift the draconian quarantine measures. However, their hopes for zero infections were dashed when a second wave of infection reared its ugly head in June this year, this time in the capital, Beijing. 227 confirmed cases were reported in a span of just 10 days. Most of them could be traced back to the Xin Fa Di market, the capital's largest wholesale food market. Reports of the virus resurgence have been eerily similar across the world. Australia, India, Japan and the US, amongst others. What is it about COVID-19 that makes it so difficult to contain, despite the raft of measures taken to stop it in its tracks? With SARS coronavirus, it is behaving a lot more like you know, our run-of-the-mill respiratory viruses like influenza, um, like you know, the common cold viruses and all that, where not everyone who gets infected will get sick, one. Two is that they, some of them can get very mild disease, but nonetheless still shed the virus. And so that then pass, that those people then pass the virus in the community uh, rather than in a hospital. And so now you're trying, you know, with things like circuit breaker, lockdowns and all that, we're trying to do infection control in the community. That's hard. That's really hard. And, and the price to pay is tremendous. Life and daily routines as we know it have been upended by COVID-19. Thousands of jobs have been lost and of which some will never return. Industries and economies are on the brink of collapse, even as the world stares into a deep global recession of an unprecedented scale. It's very clear by now that the current state of the world, with the sword of COVID-19 hanging above us, is unsustainable. 
Only with the vaccine will the world be able to take the first steps on the long road to recovery. The death rate currently is just too high at about 1% overall. That's a very nasty hit on society. Uh, and so I think this is and should be a vaccinatable disease. I don't think you can just wait for it to have moved through the population. But how close are we to finding a vaccine against the coronavirus? So we might have to accept that the first vaccine that is uh, put into human use for COVID-19 might not be perfect. When the world was hit by the 1918 influenza pandemic known as the Spanish flu, there were no antibiotics or effective vaccines to fight or protect the people against infections. 50 million lives were lost and an estimated 500 million people were infected. The only viable response against the virus then was through isolation, disinfecting and quarantine. One century later, the world is living through yet another pandemic, COVID-19. While many nations are still struggling to contain the spread of infections, no vaccine has yet been found to protect the people against the virus. Unless the virus does something that we cannot currently predict, in other words, unless it becomes extinct, which seems unlikely at the moment, then yes, a vaccine is the only long-term measure that will secure everybody into the future. Massive efforts are now underway to develop a vaccine strong enough to fight and eliminate the deadly virus. Latest reports indicate that almost 200 vaccines are now being developed across 30 countries, including the US, the UK, India, China, Singapore and more. And some 15 projects are already into human trials in various phases. But developing a vaccine is not an easy task. What it usually takes about 15 to 20 years to develop, researchers are now accelerating the process of vaccine development so that it could be ready for emergency use by next year. But why does it traditionally take such a long time to produce a vaccine? In a nutshell, it's because of history. Uh, you know, the vaccine development started, you know, uh, what, 60, 70 years ago, um, perhaps even longer. And, and so the process kind of add on, right? So there was the first few vaccines came along, and they went into humans safe, then came along others that, you know, didn't work as well, wasn't safe. So people added on studies to make sure that these events don't happen again. And I think we can begin to shrink that timeline all over again. But unfortunately, the way it's worked is that we just kept adding without, we didn't take anything away, right? And so then it becomes longer and longer. The novel coronavirus was first detected in December 2019. By January 11th, the genetic sequence of COVID-19 was made available to the global scientific community. And from that point, the race was on to develop a vaccine against the virus. By March, there were already four vaccine developments entering human evaluation. In July 2020, Almost 200 vaccine developments were in progress across the world. A key challenge that we face today is not only how to develop the vaccine, but how to develop it quickly. I mean, we've never had a vaccine uh, effort like we have today, where the vaccine needs to get out there, you know, within the next year, 18 months. A virus usually infects a human body by attaching itself to the human cells. It then starts replicating or making more copies of itself and multiplies throughout the body. Eventually, the cell bursts, releasing all the new viruses it has manufactured and it goes on to infect other cells. 
When a vaccine is injected into the patient, the cell will then start to produce the coronavirus spike protein. This will trigger the body's immune system to produce antibodies and activate killer T cells to destroy infected cells. Once a virus is killed, the antibodies continue to circulate inside the body. So, if the patient encounters the coronavirus again, the body immune system will remember the virus. It will then mount another attack against the virus with the antibodies and killer T cells. When we talk about that, we are trying to boost the immune response and to try to contain it and get that vaccine across to risk groups. So the people who are most vulnerable, get them covered and then maybe eventually achieve herd immunity. So that's where the vaccine story is coming from. What we're really aiming for is a vaccine that takes away the fear of the disease. In other words, if you get vaccinated and you are pretty confident that you're not going to die, then I don't think people will worry too much about the virus. The other thing to note, of course, is that while it only circulates in a small proportion of the world's population, there is the possibility that if you vaccinate extensively, you will make it become extinct. You will force it out. It just doesn't have anywhere to go. And just like every other virus that is uh, in the face of a vaccine, it could simply disappear. Creating a vaccine is a complex and difficult process. Establishing a vaccine that is effective and safe to use in humans is another challenge facing researchers. Even after laboratory and animal testing, it has to go through a series of clinical human trials and that will involve hundreds if not thousands of participants. A lot of what we do in the lab did not necessarily translate to what's going to happen in humans because nothing in the lab now uh, tells us exactly what's going to happen in humans. So that's probably arguably the biggest hurdle. And so, you know, getting something into humans and showing that it is safe and it has a chance of working, I, I think, is, is uh, one of the biggest hurdles to, to jump through. The University of Oxford has recently made a major breakthrough in the fight against COVID-19. Results of an early trial show that their vaccine appears to be safe and has generated a strong immune response from human volunteers. The clinical trials involved more than 1,000 people who received a dose of the vaccine. And they have developed antibodies and killer T cells that can fight and kill the coronavirus. The speed of which they've done this is really remarkable and, and I, I, you know, it, it underscores and, and again we need to um, be aware that the reason why uh, Oxford and, and you know, Moderna and all that have been able to move so fast is because they've done this before for other uh, viruses. Right? So the Oxford group has done a lot of work on MERS, they've done work on Ebola, they've done you know, quite a lot of work in the past, chikungunya and all that. And so how they got this very rapidly into humans is they went to the regulator and said, look, look at our past record in terms of the safety. And that builds the body of evidence to say that, you know, I'm using the same chimpanzee adenovirus that wouldn't cause an infection in man. Among those who volunteered for the Oxford Human Trial is 47-year-old Lydia Guthrie. The University of Oxford and pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca started the vaccine development in March. Lydia replied to the recruitment drive for volunteers with the blessing of her family. She wanted to do it for her children and the next generation. It's a decision that affects my whole family, not just me. Um, and if they hadn't wanted me to go ahead, then I wouldn't have done. Um, but when I explained to them what it would involve and, and why I wanted to do it, um, they were really supportive. The virus is having a big impact on children and young people in particular. I think it's really hard for teenagers not to be able to see their friends and not to be able to go to school. So they really would benefit from a vaccine. So I think they thought it was a good thing. <laughs> it felt to me like the right thing to do. Volunteers are putting their lives on the line when they signed up for the clinical trials. 
but Lydia was assured by the doctors that the risk of side effects were very small. And she was also more motivated by the desire to help researchers find a vaccine or a cure that could protect the entire population. They are working at superhuman strength to try to find a vaccine uh, that we will all benefit from. And even if they're not able to find a vaccine right now, my understanding is that the way science works, you learn just as much from experiments where you're, the, answer, the outcome isn't what you'd hoped for. So even if they don't find a vaccine just yet, they're bound to find something, some really interesting new data and new information which will then inform the next step. Another volunteer is 31-year-old Fan Ri, who works in medical services in Wuhan. In March, when he first heard about the recruitment drive for vaccine volunteers by the Academy of Military Medical Sciences China, he quickly signed up. I was in the recruitment drive for vaccine volunteers by the Academy of 然后我了解到有在16号的时候 而且我们注射了这次疫苗之后，身体也没有发生什么呃很明显的变化。我们是很相信我们的科学家以及专家组成员。Forty-five-year-old Hao Wei works as a market researcher in Wuhan. He too participated in the second phase of clinical trials in China with the blessings of his father. At that time. The research company had tested the experimental vaccine on 508 volunteers in April. So, we also examined the first two experiments. We knew that there was a risk, but we still felt that it was possible. The epidemic has now swept the world. We said that the people who are working in the epidemic can do some good. I had the idea that this is possible to do, because I was in Wuhan, and it was happening in Wuhan to do such an experiment. To date, the U.S. is one of the leading players in the global race for a COVID-19 vaccine. It has 39 research projects, while the Chinese institutions have 20. In human trials, the U.S. is working on three projects, while China has five. I think the U.S. and China are running neck and neck in the development of a uh, vaccine for COVID-19. I think there's more divergent efforts going on in the U.S., although the Chinese effort may be a little bit further along. Yet, despite a significant progress, caution greets the vaccine trial results. Vaccine developments are a complex process that comes with many uncertainties. The first company that's able to reach the finishing line does not necessarily mean that the experimental vaccines will work against the dreaded virus. The issues around it are whether or not it gives sterilizing immunity, that is, it stops you being infected altogether, or whether it just protects against disease. And the data that's been released so far indicates the latter, that it only protects against disease. So the problem with that would be that someone who is vaccinated could still be infected and could then spread the virus. So it's not the perfect solution, but it's clearly stopping the disease, stopping the, the danger of death is clearly high on the agenda. I think it's going to be a really major challenge how to ramp up the, the manufacture of the vaccine, how to test the vaccine, how to make sure that it's safe and effective in patients uh, before you do a mass immunization of essentially you know, most of the world with, with this drug. So um, I think that's, that's really going to represent a key challenge uh, for us and others developing a COVID-19 vaccine. Between being the first and getting it right, it's more important to get it right. There's a lot at stake in the race to develop the vaccine. It's not just about public health. There's also a geopolitical advantage to being the first. The two countries leading the vaccine race are the US and China. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, 
U.S.-China relations were already in a fragile state. But now, the combination of the pandemic, the effects of the ongoing trade war between the two economic giants, coupled with the U.S. president desperate for re-election in November, have brought the bitter rivalry to a whole new dimension. Who will win the COVID-19 race and be the first to produce the vaccine? Should they cooperate instead of competing against one another in the search for a vaccine? So really, Beijing and Washington are viewing the idea of developing a vaccine as uh, it, really from the perspective of a, of a zero sum mentality. One is going to have the, uh, the victory of producing the first vaccine. While scientists are working at a breakneck speed to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, global tensions have simmered between two of the world's biggest economies, the United States and China. Both countries have traded barbs on numerous issues involving trade and balance, Chinese activities in the South China Sea, arms sales to Taiwan, the treatment of Muslims in Xinjiang, Hong Kong's autonomous status and the fate of Chinese telecoms giant Huawei. The COVID-19 outbreak has further damaged relations between the two sides. President Trump has repeatedly blamed China for the outbreak, which has killed more than 160,000 people and infected more than 3 million in America alone. The comments of President Trump that have really focused on China as the origins of this vi virus and enabling us to spread all around the world are in part to deflect blame from himself uh, because President Trump is, of course, running for re-election. And there are many people who believe that he has not managed the spread of the pandemic very well in the United States. So China is an easy target. There is more than an element of distracting from some of the domestic challenges that, uh, that uh, the United States has. Um, and uh, for most was how the US uh, mismanaged the early stages of the crisis. Just as we say, China, China uh, mismanaged it in the early stages, so too uh, did the United States. But of course, we are talking about, uh, um, shall we say, uh, a president who obviously cannot do anything wrong. So the blame has to go somewhere else. Yeah? Um, and in this case, um, he has blamed uh, China. Both countries are now in an all-out race to find a vaccine for the coronavirus. For China, getting a vaccine first would help boost its image as a global technology leader. Being the first to offer the world a vaccine will also help to ease international criticism over its handling of the outbreak. For the US, on the other hand, an America-first vaccine could also help bolster its leadership in science and technology. That, in turn, will also lend weight to President Donald Trump's re-election bid and silence his critics over his handling of the COVID crisis. Well, I think, obviously, there will be an element of bragging rights there. Yeah, um, We are, after all, looking at what is quite likely the most uh, dire uh, health crisis or crisis in general that uh, the world is facing, at least in living memory. Yeah? Um, and the US and China both have developed over the years very robust infrastructure for uh, biotech, bioscience development, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, etc. So this is really a test uh, for them. In May, U.S. President Donald Trump launched Operation Warp Speed. The multi-billion dollar and multi-agency collaboration will fast-track American efforts at finding a vaccine for 300 million Americans by early next year. Operation Warp Speed has also invested in the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca's project in the UK. Both research institutes made a major breakthrough recently with their experimental vaccine. 
the vaccine managed to trigger a strong immune response in early stages of clinical trials. Noticeably, Operation Warp Speed excludes partnership with any Chinese vaccine developers, despite the Chinese having more human trials in progress. Well, the United States has brought together some key companies to work together and put some resources behind the effort to develop a vaccine and limit the duplication of efforts so that we can accelerate this whole process. Uh, there is certainly no discussion of including China in this process at all. So this is all being portrayed through this lens of competition between the two countries. And I see no potential for cooperation in development of or manufacture of a vaccine between the United States and China. But the blame game continues unabated. U.S. Senator Rick Scott, for example, has accused China of trying to sabotage American efforts at developing a COVID-19 vaccine. The U.S. Justice Department has also recently accused China of sponsoring hackers to steal coronavirus data, a charge which Beijing denies. For the U.S. and China, being the first to develop and produce COVID-19 vaccines has become a huge source of national pride. And both sides are now vying to be the first to cross the finish line. So really, Beijing and Washington are viewing the idea of developing a vaccine as uh, it, really from the perspective of a, of a zero sum mentality. One is going to have the, uh, the victory of producing the first vaccine. And uh, the Chinese, when they talk about this publicly, they talk about uh, China being the first to produce a vaccine, provide the world with public goods, as if this will help to promote China as a global leader and show that it has overtaken the United States as the most powerful country in the world. There are bragging rights involved. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a case of um, you know, the, the party that doesn't develop it first having its morale affected in the sense that, um, yes, you might uh, be able to develop that vaccine, but um, that certainly isn't the be-all and end-all uh, of, the, of the situation. There are a lot of other things to consider. The distribution uh, of that vaccine, um, the, the, the viability of, of that vaccine. I think there are a lot of risks involved simply because we are in such a hurry to develop it. The hostility and distrust between Washington and Beijing are not confined within the realm of high politics. The animosity appears to have trickled down to citizens of both countries as well, to the point that a universal search for a vaccine has become a nationalistic battle between the people of the two countries. Medical Services Executive Fan Rei has completed the Phase 1 clinical trials in Wuhan. He's eagerly waiting for a Chinese vaccine to be approved and distributed, thinking that the vaccine produced by China are far superior to other countries. Social worker Lydia Guthrie, on the other hand, is cheering for the vaccine developed by the University of Oxford. I think everybody in the world is crossing their fingers and willing on this team to succeed because that would be brilliant. Oxford University is, is a, is a world-class university. Um, the Jenner Institute has been working for many, many years investigating many different vaccines. They've done work on HIV, on malaria. Um, you know, they, they're used to grappling with worldwide problems and worldwide illnesses. So it's really fitting that it's this team that's, that's leading the way. So there is a trust deficit. And that trust deficit um, is going to, it trickles down 
to the people because you keep telling, you keep saying it uh, over the podium, people will believe it. You know, your electorate will believe it. Yeah. Um, so it trickles down to the people and it also um, shapes the nature of the bilateral uh, relationship. You know, so, so countries are going to think twice about uh, sharing information or certainly sharing a, a vaccine. The scientific community has been trying its best to keep vaccine development efforts out of the crosshair of the two rivals, the US and China. Of uttermost importance to them is to save lives instead of being caught in the middle of a power struggle between two competing giants. I think both sides should calm down and work together. And it is not a national uh, 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 dignity or, or whatever. And it's actually a life and death issue for the whole mankind. There's a political element to it. The mood these days, um, the, the appetite for cooperation is discernibly lower among many countries. Um, even countries that do embrace cooperation. So competition in science is healthy. That rigor, it brings out the best in all of us, and it's particularly on the science side. It keeps us on our toes. I think it is a bit of a race, but you know, the best will win out. And, and I think that's good for society. It's good for our community. Putting aside who might be the first to come up with the vaccine, other challenges ahead are equally daunting such as how long can the vaccine give immunity? A few months? One year? Will early versions have side effects? What about mass production and distribution? Will the vaccine be affordable? And who will get priority to be vaccinated? So should it be healthcare workers globally first? Um, should it be uh, elderly people, infirm, those that are more vulnerable to the disease? Uh, or will one country want to inoculate their own people first? It has claimed the lives of tens of thousands of people and devastated economies around the world. Today, many nations are confronted with two stark choices. Preserve life or save the economy. Trade-offs which are becoming harder to manage. Citizens are growing wary of the lockdown and physical distancing measures. Millions of people have lost their jobs. The economy has tanked, while the death toll and new infections continue to climb. The fastest way to bring an end to the pandemic is through a vaccine. The sooner it is found, the better. The key challenge is trying to keep up with that timeline, moving as quickly as we possibly can uh, to get the vaccine out there in an unprecedented uh, amount of time. We can shrink the timeline. We don't have to wait 10, 15 years for a new drug or a new vaccine to get licensed. We, we, we can do it in much faster time. Um, so, so and, and that's exactly what's happening now with this uh, COVID-19, that you know, we're doing things um, in, in a matter of uh, you know, weeks and months, which in the past, or at least before this outbreak, would have taken us three to five years. Normal vaccine production usually takes around 10 to 15 years. The time frame has now been cut shorter to less than 18 months. Research, which usually took two to four years to complete, has now been reduced to six months. Preclinical preparation, which involves animal testing, has also been cut down to six months from the original of two years. Clinical or human trials, one of the most critical stages, used to take up to five years. Now, COVID-19 human trials look set to be completed in one and a half years. Approval for use by international and national health authorities will now take six months instead of one year. Manufacturing of the vaccine, another critical stage, will be fast-tracked between three and six months from two years previously. Lastly, distribution to the public 
will be accelerated to one month instead of six months. But while speed is essential, given the skyrocketing number of infections and deaths throughout the world, the question is, is it reasonable? Should safety be the main priority instead? I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. I don't think that you need to have, you can only have one without the other. I think you can do both at the same time. Um, the, the important thing is the, the evidence, the body of evidence that guide the development. If the evidence is strong and is robust, then you can move very, very fast because you know what to look for. So that, that's how we can then use you know, very rapid methods to kind of guide and give us the confidence that what we're doing is going to be safe and that we can then do it rapidly. However, a word of caution. Not even the best scientists in the world have perfect knowledge or the exact timing when it will be ready for use or if it really works at all. I think the first to the line may not necessarily be the ones that work. So there is always that risk. It's just like dengue vaccine, right? The first dengue vaccine got licensed, but now we know that it cannot be used in those who have never had dengue before. You can only use in those who have had prior dengue infection. Um, and sometimes, you know, we don't know enough to be able to predict all these outcomes. Um, and so rushing into a vaccine and get, getting to the line may not necessarily work because there are some unknowns and we have to acknowledge that. So those are the unknowns we're focusing on. We don't know how well this virus changes. We don't know how long immunity will last. So what, what does a good result look like in the vaccine space? I think we would like to see something protection over a year because these, these infections tend to come in cycles. So can we protect for a season would probably be a great first step because it gives people confidence then to go out um, in, the, in uh, the environment. But there's no guarantee that COVID-19 vaccines will reach everyone who needs them. Instead of becoming the people's vaccine, one that will be available to all, there's a risk of richer countries monopolizing the distribution of the vaccine, leaving poor countries behind. The Trump administration has been accused of predatory tactics of trying to monopolize first rights to a COVID-19 vaccine. The German and French governments had to step in to block such alleged attempts, after reports of private German and French pharmaceutical companies announced that the US has the right to the largest pre-orders because of the strong financial backing from Washington for their research efforts. I think it's evident in the, in the cost of COVID-19 to society, right? So, so if let's say you know, the country that has the, the first to vaccinate, they'll be the first to get out of uh, all the lockdowns or circuit break uh, and uh, you know, the restriction, go back to normal economic activity, they recover, they'll recover much faster than those who will have no access to the vaccine. The US response stands in stark contrast to China. Addressing the World Health Organization in May, Chinese President Xi Jinping made a commitment that he will make the Chinese vaccine available to all. I think that as far as international uh, image, there is quite a bit at stake for China. Uh, I think the Chinese leaders know that. Um, the Chinese leaders also know that there's an opportunity here. Right? Um, the question for them is whether they can win the confidence and trust of, uh, of other countries um, and to demonstrate that it is in good faith that they're, that they're, they're extending this, this help and uh, there are no strings uh, attached to it and it's, it, it's an honest uh, effort. From Beijing's perspective, it wants to present its, its own governance model as far more effective than the governance model of the United States. And that's not only a bilateral competition, that's a global competition. Xi Jinping has said that China should lead global governance reform. And in order to have an influence on shaping the 
the international order going forward, Xi Jinping has to show that his model of governance at home uh, is working well. And managing the pandemic is, is a good example of that from, from China's perspective. Even then, it remains uncertain if vaccines, however safe and effective they may be, will bring an immediate end to the pandemic. There are still doubts over whether the vaccines, when they're ready, will be able to protect everyone. Will the discovery of a vaccine mean an end of this virus? I think we can prevent outbreaks of COVID-19, but we won't be able to get rid of SARS coronavirus too because it came from an animal and we, we can't vaccinate all the animals especially the wild animals, that this virus came from a bat because of the sequence of the virus, you can't go and vaccinate all the bats, right? So we will have this virus and occasionally it will spill over and, and cause outbreaks, especially when vaccination rates are low. Um, and that will be the challenge. The available studies and publications on the vaccine has been promising, but it's not yet a take home that we have a vaccine that's going to come out, that's going to be the answer. We have to still keep our guards up as far as social habits, public behaviour. It's absolutely important that we do not lose track in that regard. We might have to take, to accept, to accept that the first vaccine that is uh, put into human use for COVID-19 might not be perfect, might not even be able to prevent infection, but if it could prevent severe disease and if it could not uh, have a major adverse effect, that's already good enough. And we might uh, use that in the very high risk groups, for example, elderly, those with underlying diseases, the health professional, healthcare professionals, and some of these high-risk groups. A COVID-19 vaccine is not a silver bullet to the problem. Any public health pandemic is a complex issue and it takes a multi-layered effort to contain it. Keeping up with physical distancing and high level of hygiene and all that is your bread and butter, right? Then once you have that and then you overlay on that, you know, vaccines and drugs, then we have a chance of uh, really overcoming this virus. And as the world waits impatiently for a COVID-19 vaccine, the time for reckoning will soon arrive. How well governments and world leaders react, manage and overcome the crisis will greatly define their behaviour, character and their standing in the eyes of the world. Will they be overly nationalistic, prejudicial and discriminatory? Or will they be impartial, just and magnanimous? It remains to be seen.